All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Welcome to Grace on this holiday weekend. I hope that your uh, celebrations are safe and joyous. And uh, as we celebrate all the freedoms and wonderful things that God has given us in this great nation. One of my favorite Peanuts cartoons is the one where Peppermint Patty says, Charlie Brown, it was the first day of school and already I was called to the principal's office today for bad behavior. And it's all your fault, Charlie Brown. And Charlie Brown says, my fault? How is it my fault? Why is everything always my fault? What did I have to do with it? And Peppermint Patty said, well, you're my friend, aren't you? You should have had a better influence on me. <laughs> well, let me ask you, who are you influencing? Today, we look at a, a, a teaching of Jesus from Matthew's Gospel, chapter five, which is all about positive influence. Let's look at it together. Matthew, chapter five, starting in verse 13. And by the way, we do kick off this new series today. Last year, if you were with us, you remember we looked at the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, verses one through 12. And this year, 2023, we're gonna do a number of sermons just picking up right where we left off last year with verse 13 and go all the way through chapter seven of Matthew. I think you're gonna really, really enjoy this journey. I know we're gonna learn a lot together. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. He goes on. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, he's talking now to his disciples, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Two powerful metaphors. Jesus said, you're salt. Jesus said, you're light. Now, that's not a to-do list, mind you. He's describing what we are. We are salt. We are light. But the question in my mind is, what does that look like, and how do, we, how do we function as salt and light in a world like this? Well, that's where I want us to go today, just as we kick the series off, and I wanna talk about what it means to be salt and light in a world like this. So first of all, consider with me being salt in a morally decaying culture. Now, let me just give you a heads up. I'm gonna spend a lot more time on this one on salt, because they, they kind of go together, and the principles that apply to one apply to the other. So when I say, now let's consider light, don't freak out on me, all right? Because we're only gonna spend a brief time talking about that second metaphor on being the light of the world. And I think you'll see that the principles that we look at apply to both, okay? Salt. Salt was a preservative. It was in Jesus' day, and it still is today. One of, one of my enduring memories from childhood, now remember, I grew up on a farm, very different than the kind of life I live day by day these days. But on this farm, uh, we were very self-sufficient, if you will. Virtually everything we consumed, we either caught it out of the lake, we hunted for it, or we raised it or grew it up on the farm. Very, very self-sufficient, okay? And one of the things we did every fall when the weather got cold, we would take a day, and the whole family was involved in this, all my brothers and sisters, my mom and dad, all of us, and we would kill two or three hogs, and that was our supply of pork for the winter. And once the meat was cut in the appropriate sizes, my father and I then would take this salt. We'd buy it by the big bag full. We would take this salt and begin by hand to rub that salt into the meat. And the salt, of course, preserved the meat 
from decaying. Now, the Bible teaches that this world is in a state of decay, and it has been ever since Genesis chapter three and what we call the fall. And when sin entered the human equation, believe me, folks, things went downhill very, very fast. They began to decay morally. And there was shame, and there was blaming other people for our problems, and all kinds of guilt, and And then, before you know it, there's the first killing, the first murder, the first homicide, as Cain murders his brother Abel. And so you come to this almost haunting verse by chapter six of Genesis, where the the Bible says this, chapter six, the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth. Things are going so downhill. And it says his heart, was filled with pain. What an incredible statement. So from the earliest pages of scripture, you get this picture, there's this moral decay going on. And I believe it's important we understand that or we're gonna have a very naive view of society and a very naive view of human nature. And the Bible uses a word for that. It's the word perishing. One of the better known verses in scripture is John 3, 16. It says, God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him should not perish. Interesting word, but have eternal life. Most people, I think, when they read that, they think of perishing in hell. Well, it certainly has future ramifications, but as I want you to see, usually the word perishing in scripture is describing a current reality. And scripture teaches that you're in one of two states. You're either currently saved or you are perishing, one or the other. Those are the, those are the options. A few quick examples so you know I'm not just making this up out of my head. First Corinthians, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, those are the two categories. You're either perishing or you're being saved. Uh, It's the power of God. Or let's consider another one, 2 Corinthians chapter two. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. One other verse, we could look at many, but just to make the point, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. That is describing in each of those verses a current, ongoing process. So, since Jesus said, you are the salt, you real disciples of mine, and we live in a culture that is in moral decay what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to live? Because we wanna get very, very practical with this. So I'm gonna suggest to you, there's a lot of content today, so I'm gonna ask you to really be focused and tune in. There are three options that Christians have usually taken down through the centuries when it comes to this whole question of how to be salt and light, and these are popular options still today. Option number one, is stay away from the perishing world. Do you know anyone who wants to live like that? That impulse is very, very strong. And I would say the most obvious example of this through the ages has been the monastic movement. And from the earliest centuries of Christianity, there's this idea that has persisted that if you really wanna be pure salt and pure light, the way to do that is to get far away from the corrupt world, create your own hermetically sealed environment, separate, isolate yourself, stay away from anything that might diminish your saltiness or dim your light, and maybe then you can be true salt and light in the world. Now, I'm not putting that down per se, in fact, I don't know if you've ever read this book, How the Irish Saved Civilization. What a provocative title, huh? All the Irish people get proud at that, right? How the Irish Saved Civilization. It's a great book. I love it. Thomas Cahill from several years ago. But this book simply highlights what is is definitely true, that it was often in the monasteries in the Middle Ages that 
scholarship and literacy were kept alive. So we don't need to just poo-poo that impulse of getting away. Some good things happen because of that. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. If we're talking about being salt, you see, if my father and I had looked at that 50-pound bag of salt back on the farm and this hundreds of pounds of pork, and we had said, all right, salt, do your thing, do you, there, hey, there it is, go to it, do your thing. Obviously, the meat is still gonna perish and decay. The salt is potent, but it's doing no good whatsoever because it has no contact with the meat. In my mind, people who have a stay away from the world attitude are kind of missing the point. Okay, but that's option number one. Option number two, here we go, is to become just like the perishing world. Have you ever seen anyone who likes that category? Accommodate, blend in, integrate into the values and lifestyles and mindsets of the world so that there's really no difference. Just become a complete part of it. In my opinion, this is much more popular than the first option. Adopt the lifestyle and the business ethics of the world. If you need to lie, lie. If you need to cheat, for God's sake, cheat. Everybody does it. Hey, sleep around? Sure, go ahead. As long as, quote unquote, no one is getting hurt, okay? Embrace the corruption around you. And for God's sake, don't make anyone feel uncomfortable. Now, it... I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm no expert on this, but folks, it seems to me that millions of professing Christians have adopted this option to blend in so much that there's no difference. In fact, survey after survey shows that there is no distinguishable difference between the morality of Christians and their non-Christian neighbors. Now, let me make a big caveat here. I've been stressing the word professing Christians. I'd like to believe that real disciples of Jesus really do have a different morality, and I, I'm honestly convinced that we do, and that while we're frail and while we're still sinners and still broken people like unbelievers, I'd like to believe, and I know this to be true of the Christians I know, that we really are living differently than most of our unbelieving neighbors. But there's so many people professing Christians that check that box because they think because they were born in America, of course I'm a Christian. I was born in America, of course. That's what I am but it makes no practical difference in their life whatsoever. Now listen, if we've adopted this option to just so blend in that there's no difference, Jesus has a word for you and for me. If that's us, useless. Yikes. Say, I came to church to hear this? Useless, Jesus said. There's nothing more useless than a disciple who's lost his saltiness. No longer good for anything. Not my words, those are the words of Jesus. So you've got the two options so far, right? One is to stay far away from the perishing world. The other one is to become just like it. But there's a third option I hope you will consider. And that is to be a transformative agent in the world. Have you ever heard that phrase, in the world, but not of it? It's a pretty good phrase. And that kind of sums up this position. You infiltrate, but don't imitate. This is what we call at grace, letting your life be your ministry. You're in the world, but you're not adopting the values of the world. This, it seems to me, is what Jesus was looking for. Consider what he said in John 17, where he's praying to the Father, and he says, my prayer, Father, is not that you would take them out of the world. In other words, uh, so that they, hey, you're about to drink that milk. Was that milk from a Christian cow, by the way? I'm just curious. Because if it wasn't from a Christian cow, you don't wanna touch it. No, uh, Jesus, no, I'm not praying that you would take them out of the world, so that they only read Christian books, so that they only go to Christian shows, 
so that everything has to be stained glass. No, 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 that, that's not what I'm praying, Father. I'm rather praying that you would protect them from the evil one. They're gonna be in the world, Father, but don't let them be of the world and protect them, Father, from the evil one because he is roaming about seeking whom he may devour. By the way, he even goes on, in case we didn't get it, he goes on in verse 18 and he says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Jesus said, if you're saved, you're sent. If you're saved, you're sent into the world. So in the world, but not of it. Now, a quick footnote here, and we could spend five messages just on this footnote. Christian parents, wow, what a challenge you have. Because you're raising children in a morally decaying society and your responsibility is to try to teach them Christian values and virtues, virtues and inculcate those in your children and yet to not let them be thrown to the wolves, right? Wow, what a challenge. And so you face all these questions. Do we homeschool? Do we do the Christian school thing? Do we go to public school? What do we do? Do we do a combination? What are we supposed to do here? This is a perennially tough issue. And most Christian parents that I know are taking their responsibility very, very seriously. And there aren't a lot of easy answers to that because there's so many variables there but I'll just leave that as a footnote now and move on. So, since Jesus is sending us into the world, and he's very clear, I want you in the world. I'm not asking you to separate and, and go over here in little communities and not have any interaction with the world. And I'm certainly not asking you to just blend in so that there's no difference between you and the world. In that case, you've become useless. I want you in the world, but not of it, what does that actually look like? What, how do we function? Well, again, I'm gonna give you two options this time for how Christians tend to view this today. One option is that we would approach this corporately. Now, what do I mean by corporately? Many wonderful Christians I know believe that the church as a corporate body should be a political machine, okay? That's what they believe. And they believe that we should be, our job in this world is to be the conscience of the community. We are to be pointing out everything that's wrong with the world and critiquing it. So we wag our fingers at the world and when there's a sin out there among unbelievers, we're supposed to be calling it out, okay? And I've got many wonderful brothers and sisters, some of them a part, an active part of our church family who have a strong conviction that this is the kind of role, and, and some have used the analogy with me, salt stings your eyes. And so we're to be a stinging agent in the world. We're to make people uncomfortable because we've gotta kind of get in their faces and let them know what is right and what is wrong, and that's what the church corporately should be doing, and Pastor Rex, you should lead the way in that, all right? Now, I'm not doing that, and I'm not doing it for two basic scriptural reasons. I have two reservations. One is, I just don't see it in the New Testament, okay? I don't find that being either taught or modeled in the New Testament. Now, please get what I'm saying here. I don't find Jesus himself or any of the apostles starting protest movements against the corrupt Roman government, and believe me, it was corrupt, or against the corrupt government in Palestine, the government of the Herods, which was probably even more corrupt than most other parts of the world. They didn't rail against the evils of their society. Does that shock you? Check out your Bible. You're simply not gonna find it among Jesus himself or any of the apostles. That's my point. They didn't send 
letters to Imperial Rome saying, look, this is our moral position on this and you gotta take that into consideration. I'm not saying there's not a place for that today. I'm just saying you simply don't find it taught or modeled in the Bible. Is it, no, wait, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, Pastor Rex, have you ever read the Old Testament? Yeah. Didn't the prophets rail against the nation? Oh yeah, they did. And you know why they did? Because under that old covenant, Israel was the chosen nation of God. And so they addressed the nation as a whole because it was a geopolitical entity that had borders and politics and all kinds of stuff. They say, look, don't make alliances. That was a political statement when they said that. Don't make alliances with Egypt because that's not where your salvation is gonna come from. And they would get in the faces of the government officials and challenge them. They definitely address the corruption in the nation. But I hope you're listening closely. Under the new covenant, the kingdom of God has not been replaced or Israel has not been replaced by any geopolitical entity. In fact, in speaking to this issue, when his fellow countrymen asked Jesus, hey, when is Israel gonna become in all of its glory and kind of rise up and throw off imperial Rome? Look at what he said in Luke's gospel, chapter 17. Once having been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, in other words, when are we gonna be strong? When are we gonna have the glory that you know we once had back under Moses and, and that kind of thing? Jesus replied, the kingdom of God does not come with your careful observation, nor will people say, here it is or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. So I hope as followers of Jesus, we're all clear on that. The kingdom of God is no longer a political state. And we don't have any geographic boundaries in the kingdom. Jesus said, the kingdom is within every true disciple. So that's one of my hesitancies. A second hesitancy I have is that I'm real concerned that in spite of all the good we can do in our world, and there's so much good we can do, and we're gonna keep on doing a lot of good as a church. We're gonna keep on addressing issues and bring good where we can have good. We've gotta always, always, always be careful that we don't lose sight of our number one goal, which is more and better disciples and proclaiming the gospel. You see, according to the Bible, there's only one alternative to perishing, and it's not building a better society. It's not educating people more. It's not solving some dilemmas that are in the culture. There's only one alternative to perishing, and that is eternal life. And that only comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's look at John 3.16 again. God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Only two options there. Once again, eternal life is not just a future thing. Let's look at John chapter five. I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned he has crossed over from death to life. Our primary function as a church is to proclaim the gospel, and we must never lose sight of that, okay? Now, you may know that as a church, we are actively involved in addressing problems all around the Capitol District. I hope you know that. We don't talk about it much. <laughs> Uh, some people call it the best kept secret at Grace, but we have partnerships with agencies all around. We're helping the homeless and the hurting and the hungry. Dozens and dozens and dozens of people at Grace are actively involved in the community trying to battle against some of the evils that are in our culture, trying to help the plight of people in our culture, trying to feed the hungry, et cetera, et cetera. I hope you understand that, all right? But let's, let's suppose 
that we could solve every issue, not just in the capital district, but in our nation. Go with me here for just a moment. Go with me, dream with me, dream with me. Let's suppose there were no more abortions, not a single abortion in an entire year, hallelujah. Let's suppose that there was no more racism in any of its ugly forms. We could just eradicate it and wipe it out. I'd be dancing. I'd be celebrating. What a great victory that would be. Let's suppose there were no more aberrant sexual lifestyles. Let's suppose there was no more poverty, no more food insecurity. Everybody had plenty to eat and a wonderful roof over their head. Oh, that would be such a victory. What a better nation we would be if we had that. Go with me here now. Dream, dream. Let's suppose that every public school Every university, every public educational institution in this country never taught a single thing that was contrary to Scripture. Woo! Can you imagine a world like that? And then, let's go a step further. Let's suppose that every politician told the truth. (laughs) Wow. We're talking miracle level now, baby. I mean... Wouldn't a world like that would be wonderful? I'd be walking around singing, it's a wonderful world. It would be awesome. What an advance that would be. And and, and we could be a part of that. Are you still with me? But as wonderful as all of that would be, and it would be awesome, in and of itself, would not bring a single soul into the kingdom of God. Are you getting this? The church of Jesus Christ, of which Grace Fellowship is just one local expression, is not called to make merely good people. We're called to make gospel-centered people. And there is a big difference between those two. Now, now don't get me wrong. Gospel-centered people are gonna tend to be good people. Hallelujah. Gospel-centered people are gonna be getting better and better because God is changing us from the inside out. But we're not here to make good people because good people go to hell. Hell is filled with people who are pretty doggone good had wonderful lives down here. We're here to make gospel-centered people who are not perishing, but are being saved. I hope you get that, because it's awfully quiet in here right now. Whoa, it's like the tension's so thick you can cut it with a knife. Because listen, and the reason I pause there is because if you don't get that, you don't get the gospel, you don't get what the church is all about at all. And I sometimes get concerned about my brothers and sisters who think that our major goal, watch this, is just to give people a little moral upgrade so their life is a little better. No, no, no. We'll do all we can and we'll keep on doing all we can to try to make the world a better place for so many hurting people. That's one of our purposes. But our main purpose is to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ so that he can make more and better disciples. Can you give God a hand? Because that's, that's his plan. <laughs> that's his plan. All right. So see, here's the problem. You say, but man, I just, I just think we ought to be telling people when they're wrong. Okay. Okay. Calm down. <laughs> Listen to what Jesus said about that. As for the person who hears my words, but does not keep them. Do you know any people who would fit that description? They kind of know right from wrong. They've heard the words of Jesus. They've even read the Bible maybe, but they just don't don't keep it. They don't obey Jesus. I'll bet you know a couple. I'll bet you work with a couple of people like that, okay? I do not judge him. What? No, Jesus said, I got a higher purpose than wagging my finger in unbelievers' faces and telling them they're wrong and bad and horrible. I've got a better purpose than that, Jesus said, for I did not come to judge the world, but to what? Save it. I want want to be a part of that. 
I, oh, it's so easy. The easiest thing you'll ever do as a Christian is to wag your self-righteous finger in an unbeliever's face and tell them they're wrong. That's, a, that's like falling off a log. Come on, come on. Being a part of their redemption? Ooh, now that, that's exciting. But that's harder, okay? That's harder. So I hope you get the point. I don't believe the church is called to be a political machine. I don't believe we're called primarily to wag our finger in people's faces and point out all the evils in the world. We are to do our part in making it a better place and we will keep on doing that, but we're not here to make good people, but gospel-centered people. Hope you get it, hope you get it, all right. So, Rex, if you don't understand it corporately, dude, how do you understand it? I understand it primarily individually individually. A mother was walking her small son to school one day. The dad usually walked the son to school, but he was out of town. So his mom was walking him to school that day, and her son kept looking all around like this, like he was looking for someone. And the mom said, who are you looking for? What are you looking for? And he said, why aren't there any idiots here this morning? She said, well, what do you mean, son? He said, well, when I walk to school with dad, we always see at least three or four idiots. <laughs> Idiot. Idiot. <laughs> see, that dad didn't realize that he was having a negative influence on his son. You have influence. So what is Jesus saying today? You're salt, you're light. You, Sarah, you, Chloe, you, Thaddeus, you, John, you are the salt of the earth. It comes down to who you are as a husband, a wife, a neighbor, a coworker, a brother, a sister. Are people thinking more of Jesus because of their acquaintance with us? Now, we're gonna do this in lightning speed, but I wanna quickly now turn and look for a nanosecond <laughs> at what it means to be light in a morally depraved culture. Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter nine, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And then he turns the table to his disciples here and he says to them, you, you, are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Paul writes in Ephesians 5, for you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. Let me just, in our closing moments, paint for you a picture of what I think it could look like to live as light for the Lord. Let's say that here is a wonderful Christian woman living in a local neighborhood here in the Capital District, and she wants to let her light shine, okay? So what she does is she prays for her neighbors by name. That is a very important thing to do. And she tries to let the fruit of the Spirit in her life just overflow to everyone around her. And so if she hears that someone is sick, she may make some homemade soup and take over a little container of soup for them, just as a nice gesture. Or if she hears that someone has had a loved one pass away, she might write a card of condolence saying, look, I'm just, I'm praying for you and I want you to know I hurt with you in your, in your loss. And she gives it to them. If she sees an elderly person uh, maybe struggling to mow their lawn or something, she may jump in and, and offer to help, or how, how can I lighten the load for you? And, and after a year or two of living like that in that neighborhood, you know what's gonna happen. Oh, you know, the word's gonna get out. Hey, have you met, have you met this lady down here? She is amazing. I mean, it's, what planet did she come from? She is such a fabulous person. And they're gonna praise her like crazy. It's just the way it works. But let's suppose that over the course of a year or two of living like that, she never says anything about her faith at all. Well, guess what? They're gonna praise her, as I say, by being this incredible, caring person and think that she is just the exception to the rule. 
Most people aren't like her, but wow, she is amazing. That's not what we're looking for, folks, for people to praise us. Jesus didn't say, if you give a cup of water, you'll receive your reward. He said, if you give a cup of water in my name, you're not gonna lose your reward. The name of Jesus needs to come in. So I would suggest that as she's letting her light shine and it comes through deeds as well as words, I would suggest that somewhere along the line when someone says, thank you for being such a caring person, that she might say, oh, I appreciate you saying that, you know, but God has been so kind and so caring to me. I, I know that's what he wants me to do for others. Or when they say, thank you for being so giving, she might say, well, you know, Jesus is teaching me that it's just a lot more blessed to give than to receive. Or when they, they, they say to her, what, what makes you like this? Uh, I appreciate you so much. Maybe she could look at them and say, you know what, you're going straight to hell if you don't change. <laughs> you know, something really compassionate and wise like that. I hope you get the point. So let's go full circle. Peppermint Patty chastised Charlie Brown for not being a better influence. The question today from Jesus is, who are we influencing? Who are we influencing? Some of you live in a marriage where your spouse is a cynic. I can't imagine what that's like to have your most cherished beliefs rejected by the person closest to you. Some of you live in a workplace where you say, Pastor, if you knew the environment I work in, Oh boy, this salt and light thing, it's awfully tough there. I, I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. But you know what? I believe your life is having more of an impact than perhaps you realize. And if you keep on faithfully living for Christ as salt and life, I think people are one day gonna praise God and give him glory because you, you were at your post faithfully living for Christ and letting your light shine. Father, thank you for your amazing people, these disciples who belong to you at Saratoga, at Half Moon, at Latham, people all over this nation who call you Lord. Lord, we do wanna live this out faithfully, and I thank you for the impact that our lives are already having by your grace, but I thank you that the impact is gonna be a lot more as we continue to faithfully live for you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.